There's a stick. We use sticks here. We're old old. That's not We're old old. fashioned. I mean, there's too much trembling with the, with the laser.
right. Thanks, everyone. It's our pleasure to invite uh, Jerry Suster from King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. Uh, before going to KAUST, he was a professor in University of Utah. He was leading a consortium, uh, UTAM. Uh, if you might have heard about it, it's Utah Tomography and Migration Consortium. So he, uh, Jerry went to KAUST in 2009, and since then uh, he was leading a consortium uh, there. Uh, so he's an expert of interferometry and seismic inversion. In fact, he has written two books. Uh, one of his recent books was on seismic inversion, published with SCG. Jerry, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. So I'm going to talk today about uh, something we developed about uh, in 1991, uh, Yilo and myself. And we published two papers in it. One was in geophysics that uh, seemed to gather some attention after about 10 years. And then there's a second paper in GGI that nobody paid attention to, but it kind of outlined what I'm going to be talking about today, except now we have uh, real field data examples and other applications. So uh, when you go to a, a doctor and you say, my finger hurts, sharp pain, well, a smart doctor will say, oh, okay, okay, I get it. I'm not going to try to analyze all the possibilities. You know, maybe there's some flesh problems, maybe some fungus, maybe a, a fingernail, maybe there's some artery problems, et cetera, et cetera. Let's uh, go to the ch go to the uh, chase and get to what we uh, he thinks is the most important uh, piece of the problem that probably points to the solution. So he skeletonizes the uh, in this case the uh, the hand and gets to the bones because uh, sharp pain in the finger says something about uh, maybe a bone a problem. And with that, he doesn't have so much data to analyze, just a, a, a much reduced data set that's very important in terms of telling you something about the problem. And uh, in that way, he was able to say that, look, uh, with the x-ray, you can see a broken finger bone there, and that's most likely the, uh, the cause of the, uh, of the pain in the finger. So, uh, in the same way, I think uh, geophysicists do have been doing the, something similar in the last 70 years or so. Rather than trying to analyze all the wiggles and trying to explain all the wiggles in your seismograms, you try to skeletonize the data into something much simpler so you can have uh, the, uh, a reduced data set, less complex, that's more amenable to quick analysis as well as maybe to the, cur uh, the current capabilities of the computers you have. And uh, as an example of why we'd like to skeletonize uh, our seismic data, we look at some data we collected uh, about uh, two years ago in Tanz Tanzania. <coughs> and uh, you can see lots of what goes in over here. You hardly see anything, but it uh, looks like some kind of noise, which is wind noise, by the way. So if you try to throw the entire data set and analyze the patient, in this case, the patient is the uh, subsurface structure of the Earth. Um, you can run into problems with misleading diagnosis. And the most uh, remedy to everything that ails you is called FWI, or full waveform inversion, where you try to explain every wiggle in the data set. So if you try to do that, um, in this case, this is a simple two-layer problem with uh, some heterogeneities in the first layer. You see these multiples and primary reflections. And form a misfit function, which is the difference uh, squared sum of the differences between your predicted and your observed data. In this case, each trace is an observed data, and you try to find a model that tries to explain every wiggle in that, and then you subtract it and get a residual, and then you square it and sum up all the uh, residuals for all the time values, not only for time values, but offset values as well, and you get this misfit function. And you plot it against different trials of the subsurface velocity model, in this case, the subsurface velocity model might be maybe different uh, velocities in that first layer, V. And you can see if you start well, well, well far from the actual model, which is around here, uh, you're going to get stuck in local minima. And this is going to cause real problems if you start using a, a, a gradient optimization method. On the other hand, if you skeletonize the data, and say you pick the first arrivals out to here, and then maybe use uh, Pawan's SVI and pick them all the way out to there, you and just invert the much simpler data, such as first arrival travel times, then the associated function, which in this case is the difference between the predicted and the observed travel times squared, summed up over all traces, you get a much more well-behaved misfit function. So you're likely to gain much more progress with your, with your gradient optimization method. 
So let's go back to uh, reducing our, our, our data set that's very complex into something simpler. I'll give you four examples. First example is uh, let's go ahead and um, uh, look at the arrival travel time of uh, both refractions and those of reflections and maybe some diffractions. And you reduce this complex data set into uh, a series of simple uh, travel time picks for each offset and each uh, reflected event that is of interest. And we have plenty of uh, uh, inversion algorithms that can help you with that problem. And one of them is reflection stereo tomography or reflection travel time tomography. Another skeletonization is uh, you go ahead and take this uh, red area, which is your Rayleigh waves, and you mute everything around it and only keep the Rayleigh waves and take an FK transform, or rather a Fourier transform in time and a radon transform, and you get a plot of omega against phase velocity, phase velocity being C of omega, and you get the fundamental dispersion curve and the higher order curves as well, and that reduces your the information, the complex wiggle information in this red zone into uh, simplified curves that you can invert for subsurface uh, shear wave velocity. Another uh, example of skeletonization is you take these uh, reflections and you migrate them. Uh, we just talked about migration uh, a few minutes before the talk. And uh, you get these things called uh, these uh, uh, common angle gathers or common image gathers and you can perform what's called migration velocity analysis on them. And the goal is to try to make sure all your migration images have different uh, uh, angle, angles or different offsets in your common image gather are flat. If they're not flat, that acts as an uh, indication that you're wrong in your velocity model, delta Z. Those residuals now, you try to make all the delta Zs go to zero. And in that case, we call that migration velocity analysis. So that's another simplification of this to get velocity analysis. And then we have a Q inversion attenuation parameter. And uh, one way to do that, that is as the waves uh, progress in offset, you have things like geometrical spreading, but the one that's most important is the Q in the rock, the attenuation of the rock. And what happens with offsets that are near, near the source, you get a associated with the, uh, that trace, the near offset trace. And in theory, for far offset traces, the peak should still stay about the same peak frequency, but it doesn't. Why? Because typically it's the uh, attenuation of the rock that kills the higher frequencies relative to the diminishment of the lower frequencies. So the peak uh, frequency of a far offset trace uh, is very different than lower than that of the, uh, the uh, uh, near offset trace. So that's also an indication of Q in the data. So there's a thing called uh, 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 frequency shift tomography uh, devised by Jerry Harris in the 90s whereby you take the delta omega which is considered to be a residual that says your Q, your estimated Q is uh, going to be uh, fairly low and uh, that's a residual and you have a predicted one and a, and a, uh, a observed one and you try to make the Q model uh, uh, explain this delta omega. So that looks great and uh, as I said before, the uh, benefit of this is that you have a much, because you have simpler data, you have a much simpler mystery for you're likely to bypass a lot of the local minima in your original complex data misfit function. What's the problem with this? Now let's move that down a bit. And the problem is when you start skeletonizing the data uh, into simpler pieces, then you typically suffer from uh, loss of resolution. And one of the uh, losses of resolutions is the fact that often people who do this skeletonized inversion have to make approximations to the modeling equation. They have to make a high frequency approximation in the form of ray tracing. Or they have to make, in the case of dispersion analysis, uh, assume a 1D uh, layered velocity model. You can't use dispersion analysis on 2D or 3D models or single arrival uh, uh, approximations. And so all, they all, all contribute to the loss of resolution in your estimated velocity or Q models that you're after. How do we fix this problem? We fix this problem with wave equation skeletonized inversion. That is, you don't need to make the asymptotic approximations of ray tracing anymore, and you don't need to make those layered approximations to get dispersion analysis to work anymore. You just go ahead and skeletonize your data and use the full wave equation without approximations. Let's see how this works. So the, uh, uh, we've already hit the motivation. Let's look at the theory of skeletonized inversion. 
So here's the skeletonization problem. Um, we like to find the Fréchet derivative, that is the variation of the data with respect to the model of interest. In this case, I'll say the model of interest is my uh, velocity, small c velocity of the uh, subsurface. So uh, uh, taking the full data, that is with all the flesh and bones in it, uh, that's easy to compute, uh, both uh, semi-analytically and numerically. Why? because we have an equation that governs the behavior of that data. That is, if it's pressure field, we have the Helmholtz equation. If it's displacement field and uh, elastic media, we have solutions to the elastic weight equation. So that kind of full flesh data is governed by equations we know about. What's hard is if you try to summarize this guy, we have not the original fundamental data, but we have skeletonized data. And we don't have, typically, a uh, full-fledged wave equation where we have skeletonized data as part of the uh, part of the variables uh, that are governed by the differential operators. How do we get that? How do we get this Fréchet derivative? Because if we can get this Fréchet derivative, we can then go ahead and do an iterative optimization uh, method to solve for the model parameter of interest. And how we get that is with a simple implicit use of the implicit function theorem. And uh, let's go through this. So uh, let's first get the Fréchet derivative, the full flesh data. Very complicated. We try to account for every wiggle, and we have for the in the frequency domain and acoustic medium, the uh, acoustic, the Helmholtz equation. And this is very easy to find the Fréchet derivative with respect to. We all know what that is. It's simply a reverse time migration of this uh, data. <coughs> But what about the tough for shade derivative, the skeletonized data? For example, travel times. How do we get that for shade derivative? Or how do we get the for shade derivative of the other skeletonized data? The dispersion velocity as a function of frequency. Or maybe in the MBA case, how do we get those shifts in the bent uh, common image gathers, uh, the depth shifts to, to be aligned? How do we get that one? or any other feature that you can uh, imagine in your data, I claim we can now use the wave equation without approximations. Okay, let's concentrate on this guy. The first step is to find a constraint equation that says something like this. Some function that's equal to zero in this case. Could be anything, could be any constant. I'm gonna claim, I'm gonna take zero for simplicity. And the way we do that is we first take a cross correlation between the predicted data, which is the white P, and that's a trace, in the frequency domain, and we uh, go ahead and cross with the uh, observed data, and this little dot corresponds to a time derivative. Uh, if we have this uh, this uh, cross correlation equation, we can set it equal to zero because uh, when you take two traces and they're not aligned with one another, one's predicted, one observed and you do a shift on those two traces, they will be aligned with a delta tau, which is the travel time residual, which is the difference between the observed and predicted traces. At that travel time residual, this correlation will be maximum. It's a stationary point when you have a shift of delta tau, the actual travel time residual. So you can set that equal to zero, and that's what we need for it to start off with the uh, implicit function theorem. And with the implicit function theorem, it says, okay, we have an equation of constraint, you perturb it with respect to the uh, variables of interest. In this case, the variables of interest are tau and c, tau being the uh, shift of the cross-correlation function, c being the velocity model. And we can set it equal to zero because that's a stationary point for this constraint function. We can rearrange this equation. <coughs> and uh, what we're interested in is to find out what the uh, tough d tau dc is, so uh, we recognize the d tau here and the dc there, and we rearrange this equation, and we get a ratio of d tau dc, and I was too lazy to bring in the partial derivative here, so I just put a d in here. And uh, so uh, rearrange this equation, we get that, but we know what df dc is. df dc, we just take a derivative of this guy with respect to c, keeping everything else fixed, and the only thing that's a function the uh, theoretical velocity model is this guy, predicted model. This is given, that's fixed. So this is the only function of c on the top here. And df d tau, well, that's the uh, derivative of this guy, tau. And that just adds another time derivative either that guy or that guy. And I didn't put it on either guy, so it's two time derivatives there. 
And so what we've done is, this is a hard problem to solve, but this is an easy problem to solve. This guy is easy because this was our original problem that we can all find the Verschey derivative of because we have the fundamental governing equation. And we can use that now to find out what the tau is, even though we don't know what the d tau, even if we don't know what the fundamental governing equation is for tau. Any questions? Yeah. So just to be clear, here you're assuming that you have an algorithm that converts our function specifically that converts the data Okay. There's no, there's no like, human element in the picking the travel times, right? You have there doesn't point. have to be a human element in right. picking the travel times. There could be, you can use the cross correlation, but that usually beware with that. And then there could be the manual picking, which is okay, but uh, the poor graduate student has to do that, beware. And then you can have something in between, which is machine learning, while I'll talk about Okay, so the easy, the hard problem is uh, solved by something easy to get. Okay. So um, when I was uh, getting this talk together, I was surprised to read that the economists uh, think the the, uh, the implicit function thing is an important part of their work. And when we first published this uh, in 1991, the one paper got referenced a lot, and the more general paper that showed the uh, generalization of this uh, never got referenced. And around that time, uh, a book came out uh, by Simon and Bloom. <coughs> And uh, I quote from the book, the implicit function theorem plays a key role in economics, particularly in constraint optimization problems. Okay. I'm not an, of course, I'm not even an amateur in this area, but I'll just take him for what he says. And then I'll take it for what it says, what the Felix Salmon Business uh, uh, <laughs> Magazine says, recipe for disaster, the formula that killed Wall Street in 2008. And they claim that in the mid-80s, Wall Street turned to the clocks, bringing financial engineers to invent new ways to boost profits and methods. Gaussian copula formula, which uses the implicit function theorem, was used. And according to this uh, article, uh, they had a way of minting money, it worked brilliantly until one of them devastated the global economy. So apparently, they never read our paper in 1991 and warned uh, people about that. But they blamed the uh, big disaster on uh, some of the quants in uh, Wall Street. And one of the tools they were using was this Gaussian copula formula that had something to do with uh, the implicit function theorem. So let's go back to this and uh, let's um, give an example for travel time inversion with pictures. Here's our PE observed. Let's first get our get our uh, our uh, constraint function together. This is the observed data. This is the predicted data. This is our delta tau, and at the delta tau time shift, we get a, a maximum of our uh, function, and that delta tau also happens to be our travel time residual. So we set that equal to zero by putting in the time derivative of this. That's step one. We got a constraint <coughs> function. And then we use the misfit function uh, using this delta tau. And we go ahead and find the gradient associated with it. It's given by the travel time residual uh, times the Fichet derivative. And that's a hard problem to solve without approximation. But now we know how to solve it with the implicit function theorem. And uh, we uh, now come, now uh, I went from this to that role because we recognize the tau dc is mainly the pdc, and this is simply a normalization factor, and this is simply a cross correlation of fixed trace. So we can approximate this guy with uh, the Fichet derivative of the uh, fundamental field variable pressure, and that's simply uh, reverse time migration of the data. What data? It turns out to be reverse time migration of the recorded pressure field trace weighted by delta tau, the travel time residual. How is that related to FWI? FWI is very similar. We have the Fichet derivative uh, in both cases that are common, except now we have travel time residual that weights our observed data, and in FWI we have the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, trace residual that weights our, that is our source function for our reverse time migration. And as we know, this uh, guy is nothing but for a single source and receiver uh, forms for transmitted arrivals, a wave path that looks like that in space. And what I mean by that is this guy forms a wave path for a single source and receiver that surrounds the specular array. And roughly the width of that first Fresnel zone 
is on the order of a uh, on the order of a wavelength, say, modulated by a distance factor. So the third step is now to take this guy and plug him into our update formula, gradient update formula, and that's the uh, that's the steps for uh, wave equation travel time. Any questions? Okay, let's go to an example of inverting VP travel times, first arrival travel times. This is a picture of our experiment in Saudi Arabia. We have a seismic source along this long blue line here, which is a receiver line. You can see the parameters, 117 shots. We shot at each receiver. There are 117 receivers. This is called a wadi. It's a dried out uh, channel for uh, a, 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 a southern rainstorm we get in Saudi Arabia every once in a while, every once in a while being maybe one or two times a year. It forms this big valley here, and then it dries up. There's no permanent river in Saudi Arabia. So we, uh, this is a farming region, and they asked us to come out here and uh, see what the subsurface looked like for possibility of uh, water uh, storage. So we went ahead and collected this data. Our source truck is right there. Data looks like this. It has everything <coughs> that you'd expect, the first arrivals, the surface waves. I don't see too many reflections here. Zoomed in, shot gather, common shot gather. Common shot gather is where you place a source at one point here, then you record the data everywhere, and that's what this is. Here's our source part right here. Notice the arrivals are coming in earliest, and then later on you have uh, the arrivals coming in at all offset geophones. That's called a common shot gather. And this is a travel time matrix. If you go ahead and pick the first arrival times here, denoted by the red uh, uh, crosses here, and plot them against shot index, against receiver index. By index, I mean, if you say this is um, shot number one and receiver number one, shot number two, receiver number two, da 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 da, da all the way to 170, looks like all the way to 220. They might have done a, a multiple uh, align uh, data set here, but where you shot into 117 receivers in one case and moved it to shoot some more. But anyway, yeah. Do you have a comment about the asymmetry of that gather? Is there a spot there that you can point to that uh, corresponds to the place where the ground roll is strong right, uh, and then changes? Or is this just a sort of random? Mm, I, 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 I can't explain it. Yeah, so I see it right. I just yeah, noticed this yeah, thing. Yeah, the lower right here. Maybe there's more, more attenuation over here than over on <coughs> this side. I don't know. It's a good point. Anyway, so what we did is took the travel times of these arrivals and plotted them against shot index and receiver index. And as you can see, when uh, you have the same shot index as receiver index, you get almost zero travel time. Uh, that is when the source is on top of the receiver, you get blue. And then blue means uh, very small values. Hot colors mean very large values. And you can see the symmetry uh, across that point. Okay, uh, a ground truth. Whenever you uh, uh, do an inversion, you'd like to have some ground truth about what's going on. So we can visually see what kind of soil it is in that wadi because it has a little bit about a meter or two sides of the wadi. You can see what kind of uh, uh, sediments are there. These are sands and gravels. No surprise when this is a wadi in Saudi Arabia where you get sudden of gravel from the mountains up there through this wadi. We also had ground tooth in the, in the, in the uh, form of a water table. There's farming here and there's a water table down uh, a number of meters as you, as you will see in a minute. And then uh, this is something that most people don't think is ground truth at all. It means nothing, but to our surprise it does mean something. It's called a zero shot, a zero offset gather. When the sources and receivers are on top of one another, you get all this stuff coming. And I thought it was just useless stuff, but you're going to find, I'm going to find it's uh, quite useful. So this is also what we're going to consider as ground truth. And if we do ray-traced, uh, ray-based tomography, we skeletonize the data, but then we uh, use a high-frequency approximation, meaning ray-tracing, do the modeling and the back projection, you get a travel time tomogram that looks like this. And this hot color corresponds to roughly that of uh, what we think is water at about 1.5 kilometers per second. So this is sediments. And uh, so here's our... Uh, contour for the uh, water table velocity. This line here, of course, depth of the water you see in this well here. So we 
the well was uh, off to the side and we just projected that depth all the way across to see how close we were. So most often if we had uh, conducted this kind of survey and gotten a ray-based tomogram, we'd be pretty happy. But now that we have wave equation, travel time tomography, we did this in a multi-scale method that as we started with low frequencies, worked our way up to higher frequencies. What did we get for the result? Here's what we got. And by the way, we injected, we saw that from the data itself, we had a Q of about 20 in the near surface. So we put that into our forward modeling code. And here's our result. Okay, quite different than um, our ray base result. Here's our ray base result. Here's our WT result. We asked the question, which one is the best one? And this again corresponds to that uh, uh, velocity that we consider to be the water table velocity of those crosses there. Well, let's compare that to our ground truth. Well, if I take this line here, R point dash Reddit, with this line here, it looks just like that. That is, let's move this line back up to there and move this zero offset gather back up to there. And notice how closely uh, we get agreement between the offset gather and the, uh, the contour associated with what we think is water table interface. And that was just amazing to us. I thought zero offset gathers were worthless. But I think they might mean something, but we weren't quite sure. So what we did was to then go to another site, uh, probably several months later, and collect some more data from a completely different area with the sand dune, and we had ground truth there. And this looks like a, you know, well, it is an aerial view from our quadcopter, but this is a cliff, and it's a cliff about two, uh, two to three meters high, and we put our experiment, our uh, source and receivers along the top of the cliff there, so we can see what actually was in the subsurface. <coughs> and we went ahead, took our zero offset data, and we plotted out like that. And uh, this zero offset data should roughly conform to what we see here. And you can almost see this darkening and this lightning and then nothing. And it kind of almost looks like there's something going on here that in a rough way correlated with what we see in the zero offset gather. Do the times and velocities match up for that? Uh, I'll show you that in a minute. Okay. So you can't see this very clearly here, but you can, when you're on the field site, you can see these cracks in the ground. And maybe they're desiccation. They're certainly not tectonic cracks, but they're probably desiccation cracks. Down below here was another wadi, but this is the top part of it. And there's these cracks here. These cracks are, uh, we thought were important. There's one here and one here as well, because we thought they gave rise to these sudden jumps in our uh, zero offset reflection gather. Well, let's see if we can see that kind of variation. WT tomogram. When we did the top WT tomogram, again, multi-scale, low frequencies, all the way up to high frequencies, similar to what we do in uh, FWR, multi-scale FWI, we get this as our variation of a, a, a boundary between a soft sand and some hard layer uh, beneath it. Beneath it, uh, looks like about a one kilometer per second compared to the 2.1 kilometer, or 0.2 one kilometer per second of the blue. We take that uh, wiggly line here, which corresponds to a contour, and then we place it on this guy, and lo and behold, wow, yeah. this is the second empirical evidence that these zero offset gas say something interesting about the subsurface, something we never realized before until we started looking for ground truth to validate our, our tomograms. Okay, let's, uh, any questions about that? Okay, so now uh, let's go for uh, inverting guided waves without any approximation of the subsurface medium. And what do we mean by that? Okay, so the problem is near surface P velocity imaging yields typically low resolution and cycle skipping in FWI because you can't account for all the waves often. So now what we do is we skeletonize the data. And what data? These are the uh, near surface guided waves. If you have a low over high velocity contrast and it's very strong, and your uh, frequency uh, in your sources are above the critical frequency for a guided wave, you get resonance in that first layer. And that resonance leads to dispersion, apparent dispersion in your, in your uh, waves that they propagate. <coughs> and we call that phase velocity. They, they vary as a function of frequency. And so uh, here's a shot gather. And uh, here's the first arrivals. And before we pick the first arrivals, but look at these river 
reverberations. They're almost like railroad tracks that parallel the first arrival. And for years I wondered, what the heck are these when I was at Utah? And my gosh, sometimes when you have subsurface velocity variations, they really amplify the lateral variations of your, da of your, uh, uh, of your data. And I always wanted to be able to figure out how to invert for these things. But the problem is there's so many wiggles to invert for, FWI is going to have a really hard time. <coughs> so what you want to do is skeleton a, a, a transform space such that things are simpler. You don't have so many wiggles to account for. And these surface waves here, these railroad tracks, uh, they're mainly propagate uh, with respect to variations in the P wave velocity, not the S wave velocity. And they map to this piece of the region up here under a radon transform and a Fourier train. This is phase velocity versus frequency, not offset versus time now. And this is much simpler data compared to this, without any approximations. <coughs> this is the fundamental uh, guided wave. We think this is probably a higher order one. If you look at the Rayleigh waves, which we'll invert later on, uh, that's this train of events. And they mainly correspond to variation of the subsurface S wave velocity. And they map into, notice, a lower phase velocity on uh, this region right here. So for now, uh, well, let's invert this guy without any approximations. So uh, you do this formally by now taking a residual between the observed phase velocity uh, with respect to the predicted phase velocity. And you use implicit function theorem. You, you go through the, you figure out this, uh, this uh, gradient formula, and the problem is you get stopped right here because this is skeletonized variation of the skeletonized data with respect to, now I'm going to call this slowness uh, because I'm going to need big C for phase velocity. So instead of inverting for subsurface uh, propagation velocities, I'm going to invert for subsurface slowness velocities or slownesses. <coughs> okay, so how can you use this, uh, this uh, implicit function theorem to uh, get that, uh, that skeletonized for shade derivative. Well, first pick your, uh, pick your uh, uh, guided wave uh, dispersion curve with the fundamental mode. We think this is fundamental mode. We don't have to know it for sure, but we think it is. And now we have uh, a blip in uh, frequency along the frequency axis. This is the frequency axis, zero, zero until it hits right here. <coughs> so this observed data can be thought of as uh, a trace, not, in the, not along the time axis, but a trace along the frequency axis that turns on and then turns off exactly at the uh, point of that dispersion curve for that particular frequency. So this is our observed trace now in the phase frequency space. <coughs> and then we go ahead and generate a predicted trace that is a dispersion curve associated with our uh, predicted model. And that generates a dispersion curve that gives a blip that should be a, so that should be agree with that if we have the right velocity model, in this case, P velocity model. And if we don't have that, we have a non-zero residual, and then we go ahead and use the implicit function theorem to go ahead and generate an explicit formula for uh, the for shape. Now in comparison, in the WT method, you had uh, traces <coughs> along the time axis and offset axis. In comparison, you now have traces along the frequency axis, which is not the time axis, but the frequency axis. And instead of the offset axis, we have frequency axis. So time offset, phase velocity, frequency. So we go ahead and uh, crank out the formula for that. And this indecipherable equation is nothing but reverse time migration associated with that guy. And we take the our phase residual and we reverse time migrate it. That is, we smear the residuals along the associated weight path in the subsurface. And that, in this way, we update the <coughs> P velocity slowness. Any questions on this? Yeah. Do you, like in the skeleton as framework, do you also modify your regularizer with any? Or are you just applying uh, gradient descent directly? Oh, no, no. We, we always apply preconditioned conjugate gradient. This is just for simple exposition. But you don't need to change your regularizer. You keep the, you don't scale Well, we mainly use a preconditioner, which is a, a source compensation preconditioner. Okay. We, we don't use too much of the regularization. You can if you want. 
Okay, so let's uh, show some examples. Uh, uh, this is a synthetic example. Uh, P velocity in the first layer is 1,000 meters per second. The P velocity in the second layer is 2,500 meters per second. <coughs> Peak frequency of the Richter wave is 40 hertz. And we have a number of these sources and receivers on the surface. 60 sources and uh, 120 receivers per source. So 60 shot gathers. We, uh, our starting model is like that. This is an indication of what 25 meters is like. The dominant frequency is 25 meters. So <coughs> the uh, vertical extent of our, our uh, sub wavelength, they're on the order of about a fifth or sixth of the wavelength. And the, uh, the spacing of our, uh, our anomalies are on the order of about a quarter or less of a wavelength. Out here, we start to get more to be a wavelength type of separation laterally. So let's go ahead and invert the data using the wave guided uh, uh, wave equation, uh, dispersion guided wave inversion. And uh, here's our tomogram, and I'll also place on here the, uh, the wavelength scales. Notice this wavelength scale from here to here is 25 meters, and we have, uh, looks like we're almost at sub wavelength resolution, which is not surprising because waveguides are uh, resonating multiples within that first layer. And the more times you visit a uh, anomaly, the more you can say something about it at the uh, sub-wavelength level. It's the free surface your forward model. Yeah. Sure. And so what is this good for? Uh, it's good for uh, things like engineering examples where you want to uh, uh, find something out about the subsurface, near surface velocity model to see if there's any uh, hazards for drilling or for uh, uh, construction. It's also good for, uh, 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 for statics, for uh, deep reflection imaging, because these statics down to about 100 to 300 meters are very important for, to correct for before, before you can start to focus your deeper reflections. So this is the observed shot gather. Uh, in red and the inverted one is in black. You can see they uh, pretty much coincide almost everywhere. We'll do a zoom view of this and you can see that they agree pretty well mm -hmm. with one another. <laughs> we have another example and uh, this is from uh, Kadima Fault near Kaust. Uh, we went ahead and collected some data up to almost 500 meter offset. See the velocity variations here. This tomogram is from our first arrival travel time tomography of the data. And one thing we noticed when we took a common one, we were looking for ground truth to validate or refute our uh, proposed model. So one thing you can do is look at the common offset gathers, not just a zero offset gather, but a common offset gather. Um, you take two traces, in this case 20 meters apart, that is a shot and a receiver that are 20 meters apart. You take that one trace and then you step over with the same offset between source and receiver and take that trace associated with that new shot position and keep doing that, and you all, all these traces now have a common offset between source and receiver 20 meters. We call that a common offset gather. So that's a ground truth validation to see if uh, we get the kind of variations we see here in here. And I don't see much. I see you know very subtle ups and downs that correspond to this guy. And over here where you see a disturbance, you see definitely something going on. But certainly this would not suggest, looking at this, would not suggest that you have some strong lateral velocity variation. What's going on? And we see this a lot. Travel time tomography doesn't say everything about what the ground truth says. So we went ahead and uh, <coughs> I just PowerPoint uh, dashed line what I thought was the variations here. And then we went ahead and did, and this is Jing Lee, uh, went ahead and did the wave equation dispersion of uh, uh, inversion of guided waves. And he got this result. And you can see that these variations conform uh, somewhat well to the uh, actual tomogram variations laterally. This is a, you know, I would su suggest that this tomogram is more likely to be the right result compared to this tomogram because it agrees with the ground truth. We did get to the point of doing zero offset gather. We didn't discover that gem until later on. Okay, observe shot gather and ray trace to tomogram. Anytime you see a lot of red and green, it means they disagree. But if you compare now the observed shot gather in green to the uh, WDG shot gather, you see a lot more agreement between the two. Here's before and here's the after. You do see disagreements starting to take place at the far offsets. Any questions about that? Okay, let's now invert for VS from the Rayleigh waves. <coughs> uh, this is a, uh, a shallow offset section, uh, a shallow depth section of what we consider to be foothill uh, 
region of the Earth. And I believe Jing Li got this from one of the SCG foothill models. And this is a variation, not a VP, but VS. And you go ahead and generate a shot and collect a shot gather. And then you're now looking at the uh, Rayleigh waves. And these are the Rayleigh waves associated with that. These are moving out at the shear wave velocity, roughly at the shear wave velocity indicated here. So often when you have so much data to compute, you can't really pick that uh, blow by blow. So you go ahead and roughly define a mute window where anything outside this window is muted and you only have the Rayleigh waves. Then you apply the Fourier transform in time and the, and the radon transform to get the phase velocity against frequency plot. But that doesn't work so well sometimes because the uh, fundamental mode starts interfering with the higher order modes. And um, so what we did was to use some machine learning to try to disentangle the two modes. And what we did was take the uh, uh, form of this shot gather, and here it is, F, K. And then we looked at features we thought were indicative of the, uh, of, uh, of the fundamental mode that distinguish it from the, from the, um, uh, the higher order modes. The one feature was what uh, Jing called coherency. He took the spectrum of one frequency and correlated it with the spectrum of a neighboring frequency. And that gave a coherency, that is, took a uh, uh, shifted dot product of one trace against the other. And that indicated what he called coherency. And he took another feature that he thought for distinguishing fundamental mode arrivals from first order uh, uh, mode arrivals, and that was dip angle. That is, he took the dip angle of the FK spectrum, local dip angle, and plotted it against color. And as you can see here, the uh, dark red corresponds to steep dip, dip angles, and the, uh, <coughs> the the light colors correspond to uh, hardly any kind of zero offset or zero uh, dip angle or energy. Then he took another feature, and you keep going and any point in the spectrum of this guy corresponds to a frequency, like this corresponds to a certain frequency, so he plots that up. No surprise, these were all laterally applied uh, <coughs> horizontal layers. And he took all three of these features and used a machine learning classification methods to uh, pick out the best curve here that would uh, mute out everything but the fundamental, uh, fundamental uh, 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 mode. And he did that by training uh, about maybe five to ten percent of the data using hand picks on this guy for different for different shots or sh different shot gathers. And then, for example, uh, he hand picked. I'm just drawing this dash in this morning. This dash line as what he thought was the best uh, window, where he commuted everything outside the window, and kept this as the fundamental curve window, and that meant that this boundary here was uh, also had certain dip angle features associated with it. And this boundary also had certain frequency of features associated with it. So that was his training set, about five to 10% of the data that he picked by hand. And then he used three different machine learning methods. One was a multi perceptron method. The other was a multi-layer, uh, uh, fully connected neural network. And the third method was a series of uh, SVMs to support vector machines. And uh, he has a lot of results on this, but his favorite is the uh, kernel-based support vector machine. And I'll just show you the results of that. Okay, so here's our original model. Here's our common shot gather. Here's the, uh, <coughs> you take the uh, Fourier transform and radon transform, and you get these dispersion curves. <coughs> the fundamental dispersion curve should move out this way, but it doesn't get to the, uh, with a high amplitude, uh, uh, higher order mode. This line here is what we think should probably be the picked dispersion curve. And why do we say that? Because he went back and did an analytical uh, three or four layer model with a low velocity zone in it. And from that was able to get the uh, analytical dispersion curve. And we think that dispersion curve probably tells us what our fundamental should look like. So we call that a theoretical dispersion curve. What did he actually pick for the inversion? He picked what he thought was something like this. So I'll just draw that in with a yellow line. So the theoretical one for a three-layer horizontal model is that white. The one he actually picked for his inversion by WDG is that yellow one. What kind of result did he get after inverting that yellow dispersion curve? He got that. Well, it's not too bad. You see the, the blue 
being uh, variations being captured somewhat well here and here. The yellow and the red you start to fall apart at deeper depths. And over here we didn't catch anything. What happened if you use machine learning to do the picking? If you use machine learning to do the picking, uh, in the FKE domain, try to window out everything but the fundamental curve, fundamental mode, and then uh, plot the dispersion curve associated with it, bingo. You got that. And that looks like it agrees much more both at the low frequency range as well as the higher frequency range in our uh, pseudo theoretical curve. And he used, like I said before, he used a perceptron method, he used a fully connected neural network. Then he used three variations of SVM, a, a, a linear SVM, a quadratic SVM, and then he went to the, the favorite one is the kernel based one. So he picks that, and what kind of result does he get after he inverts it using the wave equation dispersion inversion method? He gets that. So we compare that to that, we get a much better result. So the nice thing about this is the, the, the machine learning uh, can save you a lot of time in picking dispersion curves. And one of my graduate students is now doing full 3D inversion of 3D data for what surface waves, and he's overjoyed at something like this, because that means he doesn't have to pick over several hundred thousand traces the uh, dispersion curves. Yeah. Um, I'm not terribly good at quickly uh, reading the plot, but the dispersion story for a three-layer model will have cutoff modes. And is that just the first cutoff mode? And in your forward modeling, are the cutoff modes there? And uh, uh, is, that a, yeah, is that a cutoff mode, or is that some artifact? This is uh, likely a cutoff mode, but it sh this should continue on, those classical theoretical yeah. The uh, cutoff mode hidden. itself has information about the thickness. It has information, and we could use that information, but we're only using this fundamental mode information. And before, uh, we used to have to just guess that this was the uh, continuation of the fundamental mode dispersion curve. But with this careful uh, muting of the FK spectrum, uh, apparently uh, we seem to achieve some success in being able to see what the uh, fundamental mode looks like beyond that cutoff frequency. I don't know if I answered your question. Okay, this is my last example, inverting Q from uh, F, uh, Q data, Q information from, uh, uh, from complex data. Well, it's too, too difficult to explain all these wiggles with a full waveform inversion. So what we're doing is we're just going to use the wave equation to invert for the Q from the uh, attenuation of amplitudes from first arrivals. And we take this trace, we'll call it the red trace here, for a transform of in time, and we plot it here and we get a peak over there. And this is, uh, maybe this is a, a near offset trace. Then we take another trace, far offset trace, and uh, we plot it's for a, a spectrum here. Notice the peaks are shifted, why? We think they're uh, shifted because you have attenuation of rock. And Jerry Harris told us that we can uh, take this uh, frequency shift here uh, between near and far offset traces and use that to uh, update the Q model in our, uh, in our Earth. And we do that by uh, smearing the residuals along the rays. But we don't have to do that anymore. We can do this with uh, the wave equation. <coughs> And how we uh, can connect this to, say, wave equation travel time tomography is, notice this guy it can be thought of as a, uh, as a trace that turns on only at the peak frequency. We'll represent that by this trace here. Okay? Notice it only turns on at the peak frequency and everything else turns off. So that's our peak frequency. We picked it and we said, okay, that's our peak frequency. It's like an arrival. Not in the time domain, but in the frequency domain. Same thing for this guy, the, the, far, the near offset trace, it turns on only at this peak frequency. So if we form a trace and along the frequency axis, it only turns on at that peak frequency. So if you think of this trace uh, as the observed, or rather, uh, so this is the uh, uh, far offset, this is the near offset trace, and there's a frequency difference, a travel time difference between them. And uh, from that frequency difference, we should be able to say something about is Q. We have an observed delta F, and we also have a, uh, a predicted delta F. How do we get our predicted delta F? Well, you 
theorize a, a, a Q model. You go ahead and solve the elastic wave equation for first arrivals. You get spectrum similar to that, and we get a theoretical or predicted delta F. We'll call that big delta times this little delta F. That's our residual. We'll square it, sum up everything, and we'll use the uh, typical uh, machine for uh, uh, gradient inversion and the implicit function theorem to invert for that using the wave equation. I won't go through the details here, but this is the input Q model. We have source and receivers on the surface. This is our, uh, our wave equation inversion uh, Q estimation using the skeletonized inversion. So in this case, we use the diving waves. We also can do the same thing with uh, P waves, we can all, uh, diving waves. We can also use, do the same thing with Rayleigh waves. And this is a uh, field data from a crossbow experiment. Uh, it's on the order of uh, almost um, uh, 1,000 feet deep and uh, on the order of uh, 150 uh, meters across. We have about 100 receivers and 100 sources here. This is our FWI velocity tomogram. This is our standard migration using this tomogram. But if we use the Q model that uh, we inverted from this data, which is given by this, and then do uh, visco viscoacoustic uh, migration, here's what we get. So here's before we take into account Q, and here's after we take into account. Notice that the reflectors are quite brightened compared to the before and after. Okay, so I'm going to skip to the very end. <coughs> and summarize. I hear too many yawns in the background there. Besides, my time is up, almost. Okay, so in summary, uh, we take very complex data that is very difficult to invert using uh, some of the full waveform uh, inversion methodologies. We get stuck in local minima. So we simplify our data, and thereby simplify our misfit functions, and so we don't have so many local minima, minima to get stuck in. And a geophysical example is this, our compact data can be turned into much simpler data for at least surface waves in this way. The, the, the limitation of this, of course, is you have less resolution. You know, the less data that you have, uh, the less complexity you're going to be able to invert for in the model. So uh, it's that trade-off, but at least you don't have to suffer from these approximations we've done in the past, 1D layered approximation or dispersion layer inversion, or ray tracing uh, methods for travel time tomography. And this, of course, can be extended to the multi-dimensional case where you invert for more than just one parameter, and this is multi-dimensional use of the multi-dimensional uh, implicit function theorem. Uh, but user beware, all that glitters is not gold. This will not cure cancer. But uh, it has to be used with a grain of salt, and, uh, and uh, you have to use a lot of your intuition to guide you in what you think is the skeletonized data that is most important. You might be missing something. Maybe your intuition is perfect, but there's something that is closer to perfect than our intuition. But that's, that should be a talk for next year. Thank you. Thank you. I forgot to turn on the speaker. Time for some questions. <laughs> so, thanks for your time. Uh, so if I understood correctly, and this is the, pretty much the, the comment that you concluded on, all this work is predicated on if you have a certain skeletonization of the data that either you compute through a function or through clever machine learning methods, you can apply full wave from inversion. Have you thought about or can you comment on whether or not you believe, say, an optimal skeletonization exists, and if so, how you would find it, uh, preferably without physical intuition, or just a purely automated way of doing so? I think you already know the answer to that question. Yes, but you don't want to tell us? I can't. My student's working on that. Okay. <laughs> it's machine learning. Okay. I can't give you details. I have a question. So Jerry, most of the times we try to simplify the data in order to reduce the computational cost, right? So if you bring in the wave equation and if you want to compute the fresh air derivatives, then the computational cost of the inversion will not go down. Right. So uh, why don't we, like if you're only solving the local <coughs> minima problem and not actually reducing the computational cost, you cannot use it for very complex models which are hard to solve. 
So what's your question? So my question is you're not gaining anything in terms of the computational speed when you use the wave equation. Well, um, what I've seen is uh, our convergence seems to be uh, quite a bit faster by a factor of 2 or 3 compared to you try to do the same problem with FW1. You know, the simpler the uh, misfit function, the quicker you get downhill to where you want to go. And you don't have to stop and fool around with, uh, you know, multi-scaling so much. Okay. So it, it does, in some cases, uh, reduce computational costs compared to FWI by a factor of two or three. Not to mention a maybe more reliable uh, result. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the surface wave also have uh, sensitivity to P wave uh, velocity and the density. So, how did you like, deal with that? You mean the guided wave? Oh, uh, the, the surface wave, like, like the last one. Well, um, our uh, our assumption is uh, the surface wave, the, the kinematics, the phase of the surface wave is not highly dependent on density. So we just kept density. Up. We didn't need to mm -hmm. assume anything about density. Okay, and also P wave velocity. We also assume that uh, the P wave, the kinematics of the P wave velocity, because that's what the dispersion curve is, skeleton is focused on. The kinematics is mainly controlled by the uh, the uh, bulk modulus, not the density. Sense. I suppose if we started looking at amplitudes as well of the dispersion curve, then we might think about throwing in density as well as an unknown. But we're only going after the kinematics. And to change the subject a little bit, the, um, the that Wadi example, if there really is a commercial interest in prospecting for water there, it seems like it would be an ideal place to be looking at ground penetrating radar, where much of what you have said would apply with the simpler physics, uh, in some ways the zero offset uh, section in particular uh, is the normal thing that's collected in ground penetrating radar. Have you? Tried that. Uh, I, I believe Sharif, um, he did a GPR. I'm pretty sure he, I remember this correctly. Uh, because we're so close to the Red Sea, a lot of the sediments are filled with salt there. And so he said that uh, GPR doesn't work too well, not why. So the airfield part is conducted? It's, uh, you said it didn't work very well. But we, did, we usually do both. And we said, well, usually in the beginning when I was at CALS, we did both and we realized GPR just wasn't working very well near the Red Sea, and so we stopped doing that. And always the story about Yeah. But in another area, it might be wonderful. It might get down to 30 meters, maybe 20 meters, 30 meters, a GPR. Some places probably you already know works really well. Yeah, clean sand, and that clean beach sand is good if it's dry, but the wadi isn't clean beach sand, and if it's full of gravel, it's, and I really couldn't say without looking at data, but. It seemed like an attractive place to try. They were used, they were, they wanted to look at the possibility of water storage in the water, and dumping uh, excess water there as a means of storage, as a reservoir, and that was one of their plans. Any other questions? Okay. Any more questions? Thank you very okay. much for your attention. Thank you.